for now. Uh, we are recording this webinar and we will send a follow-up message to all of you with a link to the recording this afternoon. We will also post that with a recap of this webinar on our website and I'm sure many of the other groups uh, who are joining us today will share that as well. I want to take a quick minute to introduce our speakers for today. Um, from from the Alliance for the Great Lakes, we will have, you will hear from Molly Flanagan, our Vice President of Policy, with me here in our Chicago office, as well as Crystal Davis, our Policy Director, who will be calling in and are from our Cleveland office. From Freshwater Future, you will be hearing from Tony Moss, Manager of Strategy. He's calling in from Ontario. From Michigan League of Conservation Voters, you will be hearing from Charlotte Jamison, who is their Government Affairs Director, calling in from Michigan. And from the Ohio Environmental Council, you'll be hearing from Christy Meyer, their Vice President of Policy, calling in from Ohio. To get started, I'm going to turn this over to Crystal Davis. Go ahead, Crystal. Thanks, Jen. Good afternoon. Um, as you guys are all aware, um, on the morning of August 2nd, 2014, just three short years ago, Nearly a half million people in Toledo woke up to find uh, their drinking water poisoned. Uh, so the ban, um, the ban on their drinking water supply that comes right from Lake Erie lasted two and a half days. A few days later, a few uh, actually weeks later, residents of Peely Island, Ontario, faced a similar ban that lasted nearly two weeks. So that's two weeks without uh, tap water. So water catastrophes like this affects us all, uh, black, white, rich, poor, Republican, and Democrats alike, we were all impacted. Uh, parents couldn't bathe their children, immobile seniors had to wait for folks to bring them bottled water, and businesses were shut down or had to severely curtail uh, their business operations. Um, though the issues were resolved, as you can imagine, many Great Lakes residents still live in fear of one day waking up to find that their water is contaminated again. And so like many of us, they look forward to the annual NOAA algal bloom forecast. Go to the next slide. So this year, NOAA and its research partners predict that Western Lake Erie will experience a significant hump algal bloom this summer, potentially reaching levels last seen in 2013 and 2014 though it will be smaller than the record bloom of 2015. And so essentially, if you're trying to figure it all out, there's a strong possibility that this summer's algal bloom will grow to be the third largest in recent years. This is concerning. Um, it's a global issue. It's a national issue with similar uh, problems in Florida and other parts of the country. And it's, most importantly to us, a local Great Lakes issue. And so um, just last year, there were beach closures in Ohio and Michigan, which signaled to us that we have a lot of work to do. So now I'll pass the torch to my colleague, Molly Flanagan, to talk more about harmful algal blooms and a commitment to protecting our greatest natural resource. Thanks, Crystal. This is Molly, and thanks, everybody, for joining. So some of you might be wondering, okay, we're having these harmful algal blooms each year, but what is causing them? And a strange thing about it is that we actually, what causes these harmful algal blooms is nutrient pollution. That's confusing because most people think of nutrients as a good thing. In this case, we actually have too much of a good thing. So we're getting too much phosphorus and nitrogen in the water, and this, these, this extra nutrients is collecting in the water and actually creating these toxic algal blooms. So that's when you see the thick mass of green in Lake Erie that make it unsafe to swim um, and can make the water toxic for fish, pets, and people. So where is, this, where is this extra nutrient pollution coming from? It's coming from a number of sources. Um, the main source of pollution uh, in the Western Lake Erie Basin is coming from farms from manure runoff and from chemical fertilizers that are applied to the land. But extra nutrients are also coming from cities, sewage treatment plants, um, and septic systems. And in terms of what, what are different people doing about this, 
um, local governments have actually done a lot to curtail the amount of nutrients that they're putting into the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, they're doing a great job of um, regulating some of the sources of pollution, like industry and sewer plants. Cities have spent billions of dollars to keep sewage out of the Great Lakes. On the flip side, uh, the agricultural community remains largely unregulated. So there aren't very many regula regulations about the nutrients that are coming off of farm fields into Lake Erie. And while many farmers are trying to do the right thing, um, we actually need many, many more farmers doing a lot more to address the problem. Next slide. Um, two years ago, the environmental community and many of you on the phone were part of a really big success. Um, our organizations collectively got the governors of Ohio and Michigan and the Premier of Ontario to commit to reducing the amount of nutrients flowing into the Western Lake Erie Basin by 40%. Um, that commitment part is, is a big promise to the people of Lake Erie that these jurisdictions want to and plan to reduce the amount of nutrients going into the lake and therefore reduce harmful algal blooms. Um, unfortunately, next slide, uh, progress toward that commitment has been really, really slow. Um, Ohio, Michigan, and Ontario uh, made this pledge to a 40% uh, reduction, and they're all on the hook to create plans to reduce the amount of pollution flowing into Lake Erie from all sources. So from farms, from cities, from industry, from septic systems, from, from every place that they're coming from. Um, and so several of the jurisdictions, Ohio and Michigan, have already put out draft plans, and Ohio is preparing to put out a draft plan soon. Sadly, these draft plans don't have any enforceable mechanisms. There isn't anything that says that the sources of pollution that have been identified have to actually do anything to reduce the pollution that they're putting into the lakes. So they're pretty vague and they're unenforceable. And unfortunately, we don't think the way that they're currently drafted, they're going to do enough to actually help the jurisdictions meet the 40% pollution reduction target. And so what does need to happen to get us on the road toward uh, the 40% reduction target uh, set by the jurisdictions. Tony's going to tell us more. Thanks, Molly. Uh, it's uh, it's Tony Moss here with Freshwater Future, calling you, uh, joining you from Kitchener, Ontario. Um, so, as Molly just said, um, you know, progress on the actions that we that that are needed to address the challenges that are facing Lake Erie has been has been very slow and and. And it's been slow as individual states in the province of Ontario, along with federal agencies, are developing these plans that Molly referred to to uh, reach the 40% target. Um, those plans, um, depending how they uh, shape up, are, are going to be vitally important to the long-term solution. Um, but we believe there are some clear actions uh, on which progress can be made right now and, and that the plans can catch up on. So you'll see before you the uh, three priority actions that we've identified uh, for a cleaner Lake Erie. So number one, banning the spreading of manure and fertilizer on frozen ground or on ground that's saturated with water because of heavy rains or snow melt. Uh, two, requiring comprehensive nutrient reduction plans by farms in the Lake Erie Basin so that it is clean water, not polluted water, that is running off of farm fields. And number three, improving the monitoring of water quality in waterways that are flowing into Lake Erie, so the rivers and, and creeks that are flowing into Lake Erie. And this is important, critically important, so that everyone knows, from agricultural operations to governments to NGOs and citizens, that we have the evidence needed to understand what progress is actually being made towards this 40% phosphorus reduction commitment made by the governors of Ohio and Michigan and the Premier of Ontario. So these three actions are drawn from a broader analysis comparing policies and practices for reducing phosphorus runoff in Ohio, Michigan, and Ontario that we at Freshwater Future and the Alliance for the Great Lakes have partnered on and we will be releasing in October. Uh, based on that analysis, we've determined that to date, progress on the three actions that you see before you on the slide is varied across the three jurisdictions. And what we'd like to do now is share a top-level view of where those three jurisdictions are, Michigan, Ohio, and Ontario. 
So to do that, I'm going to first uh, pass the mic over to Charlotte Jamison, and then from Charlotte, we'll go on to Christy Meyer, uh, who will talk about Ohio, and then I'll pick things back up and talk about the situation in Ontario. Yeah, thank you so much, Tony. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about kind of where things line up in Michigan on these three uh, policy priorities. And unfortunately, the story in Michigan is that we have not done nearly enough, even on these uh, these critical first steps. Um, in Michigan, banning manure spreading and fertilizer spreading on frozen, snow-covered, and saturated ground uh, is not a policy that we have in place statewide. Um, there are some restrictions within um, the permitting process for concentrated animal feeding operations that require them to have six months of manure storage, but there's not a strict policy in place um, that would ensure that farms are not uh, winter applying. And the real problem with winter application is that it doesn't sink into the ground the second the snow melts or the ground unfreezes, it all just runs straight off into rivers. So it's a real big, big problem here and I think it's a, a, a policy solution that we would like to see put in place here in Michigan. When it comes to nutrient reduction plans, we also likewise do not have any sort of uh, um, statewide policy that requires nutrient reduction plans to be in place on farms. This is a voluntary um, uh, environmental stewardship program um, called the Michigan uh, Agricultural Environmental Insurance Program, and that does uh, require um, or that does, in order to get certified under that program, you do have to do some planning. Um, but again, this is not a robust system and it's not uh, sufficient in terms of voluntary measure um, to really see the reductions that we need to see. And then when it comes to water quality monitoring, Michigan does do some water quality monitoring, but we're really facing two big problems. One is that uh, funding for water quality monitoring here in Michigan was being essentially done primarily through the Clean Michigan Initiative bond, and that bond money is running out. So we are approaching a point at which um, we won't really have funding in the state to do this sort of monitoring. There's some federal funding um, that we could look towards, but the state uh, legislature and the governor's office have yet to kind of come up with a solution on the funding side of things. And then the other problem is that within Michigan's plans around how um, we're going to hit the 40% reduction goal that Molly outlined, um, there is no discussion of how Michigan is going to build a robust water quality monitoring system in the Lake Erie watershed. There were some gaps in monitoring that were identified, um, but there's no real plans or uh, discussion in place of how we're going to get a really solid water quality monitoring program off the ground so that we have the data and the knowledge that we need to know um, if we're headed in the right direction and if what we're doing is really working or not. Um, so unfortunately here in Michigan um, not a lot of progress forward on any of these three policy priorities. And with that I will hand it to Christy to talk about Ohio. Thanks so much Charlotte and good afternoon everybody. Um, so Ohio has taken some small but important steps to reduce uh, toxic algae over the past couple of years. And the state um, requires anyone applying chemical fertilizer to be trained on how to handle, store, and apply the fertilizer and encourage farmers to develop and implement a nutrient management plan. Many have been certified, but we continue to hear about how farmers are over applying the fertilizer. And then the state also requires farmers to not apply manure or chemical fertilizer on snow covered, frozen, and saturated soils, or if there will be a 50% chance of precipitation or greater that day. This restriction, however, is riddled with loopholes and it allows farmers to continue to spread on frozen or snow covered ground. And we know that farmers are doing so because they can apply if there is a, um, a standing crop. And so we, we continue to get uh, um, calls about how farmers are still uh, applying on snow covered ground and present ground. And in Ohio, only the supersized livestock farms are required to have nutrient management plans. No other farm is required to do so. Again, 
They do encourage farmers through the certification program to um, draw up plans, um, but uh, no other uh, farm is required to do so. And as you heard from Molly and others, um, Ohio signed that commitment to reduce uh, the nutrients that are flowing into Lake Erie by 40% by 2025. And the state is putting together plans to meet that, that um, commitment. And that does have some good measures in it. The Ohio EPA has put some good stuff in there. The Department of Natural Resources is doing some really great stuff. The Department of Health is as well. And it does include expanding monitoring stations um, in Lake Erie, the Lake Erie watershed. We currently have 21 monitoring stations in the western part of Lake Erie, and the, in the plan that we will hopefully see, the draft plan that we'll hopefully see in a couple of weeks, um, we'll talk about how they're going to expand that monitoring system as well. But largely, the Ohio Department of Agriculture is relying on the same old, same old, right, voluntary measures. And I think as we heard, these voluntary measures just aren't going to help us hit the mark. Um, because if they were, then we wouldn't be here talking today, or we wouldn't continue to have those you know, a forecast every season about how big that algal bloom is going to be. So um, what we really need in the state is we kind of need that all above approach. And what do I mean by that? I mean voluntary practices. We need to continue those voluntary practices. But as Molly said, we need them on a much larger scale. And we need common sense regulations and funding to curb that tide of pollution causing these blooms. We do. Um, what do I mean by those common sense regulations, um, and they're outlined in this, uh, you know, this slide as well, is limiting the amount of fertilizer and manure that's spread on farm fields to what the crop actually needs. And then working with a professional, like a soil and water conservation district professional or somebody from the Natural Resource Conservation Service to help draw up certified plans of Farm health, good soil health, and also keeping that pollution out of our rivers, streams, and lakes. Um, and then making sure that they're implemented and uh, enforced. And so Ohio, again, to sum it up, has made some really good baby steps, but a lot more needs to be done. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tony. Thanks, Christy, uh, and great summaries uh, from Michigan and, and Ohio. Let me quickly um, give uh, you all a sense of where Ontario is at related to these three um, action items. So um, as it relates to spreading of manure and fertilizer on frozen and saturated ground, uh, regulations do exist under Ontario's Nutrient Management Act that prohibit the spreading of manure in winter months. Um, but uh, as we've heard from, from other jurisdictions, there are gaps. Uh, and a big gap is the fact that the prohibition does not apply to spreading on, on saturated ground. So it does apply to that, uh, that frozen ground, but has yet to be uh, expanded to apply to, to uh, spreading on saturated ground. Uh, enforcement is also an issue. It's one thing to have uh, regulations and legislation. It's another thing to, to see that enforced. And particular to this, these regulations uh, regarding uh, spreading of manure on frozen ground, the primary mechanism really for enforcement is, is via complaints by the public or neighbors who are calling into regulatory agencies, as opposed to the agencies themselves uh, out there on, 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 the, uh, on the ground. Uh, there's some good news in all this. We've been talking, uh, others have been talking about these uh, domestic action plans that are being developed. Ontario's draft action plan does recognize that there are gaps as it relates to the spreading of manure and fertilizer on, on frozen and saturated ground. Uh, and Ontario's committed in that plan to considering further restriction on, on the application of nutrients during the non-growing season. So uh, there is some light in the, uh, the draft action plan um, but uh, we are certainly anticipating more specifics uh, as that plan is translated from the, its current draft into, into the final uh, um, action plan for addressing these issues in Lake Erie. Um, in terms of uh, Ontario status requiring comprehensive plans to reduce nutrient pollution or nutrient uh, reduction plans, again, the Nutrient Management Act in Ontario does include a framework um, that requires nutrient management plans or strategies. But that only applies to livestock, live, sorry, livestock operations and only those above a certain size. Uh, maybe more concerning is that field cropping operations are exempt, uh, and they're exempt even where they are using manure to fertilize. 
So this um, gap, I guess, is particularly concerning uh, for Lake Erie because most of the agricultural land in the Ontario portion of the Lake Erie watershed is used to produce field crops, uh, corn, soy, and wheat. Uh, lack of enforcement is also a concern uh, as it relates to these plans. Ontario's Auditor General uh, reported in, that in 2013-2014, uh, uh, only 3% of the farms known to have to adhere to those regulations were inspected. Um, so we do, again, have, have, a, uh, have an enforcement gap. And finally, on water quality monitoring, uh, I'll be brief. Like other jurisdictions, there are gaps in the system. Um, uh, for example, uh, we only have limited sampling to capture and understand the impacts of those big, intense rainfalls and snow melts that we know are a major contributor to the problem. So more event sampling is one of the, the key needs in terms of water quality monitoring. And there are, there are many others um, in terms of getting to a comprehensive uh, water quality monitoring program. Um, but it does go without saying so that increased investment in monitoring is needed. Um, but that money needs to be spent strategically and it needs to be spent strategically to support the implementation of nutrient reduction practices where we have the biggest problem and to assess the progress towards that 40% reduction, as my colleagues have said, so that we know if the actions being taken out there on the land are actually uh, moving us in the direction we need to be going to have a cleaner lake here. So that um, wraps our review. Uh, before I pass um, the mic back to Jen for our question and answer, I just wanted to alert you to uh, a couple of things. Uh, first, a call to action. Um, you'll see it on the screen before you. We're asking you to sign on to and spread the word about a petition that we've put together that's urging the governors of Michigan and Ohio and the Premier of Ontario to take immediate action on the actions we've identified in this webinar. So you can go to greatlakes.org slash take action. And I believe some of our other organizations, I know Freshwater Future has our own version of this action up on our website as well. And then finally, before I pass it over to Jen, I wanted to uh, remind you that, as I noted earlier, the material we've been discussing today is part of a more comprehensive assessment of progress by Ontario, Michigan, and Ohio on implementing a broader range of policies and practices that will be needed to reduce pollution running into Lake Erie. Uh, the Alliance for the Great Lakes and Freshwater Future will be releasing that full assessment in October, and we're doing so in advance of the Conference of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers annual meeting where, as we understand, discussion of progress toward their joint 40% reduction target is on the agenda. So stay tuned for more from the Alliance for the Great Lakes and Freshwater Future on this, and of course from uh, our colleagues with Ohio Environmental Council, Michigan League of Conservation Voters, and, and all the others that are working hard out there to, uh, to push for action for a cleaner Lake Erie. Thank you, Tony, uh, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, for those of you that are interested in submitting a question, we have a number already. Uh, just use the question or chat function uh, in the GoToMeeting menu bar, uh, submit those, and we will do our best to try and get to as many of those questions as possible. So I'll start with um, a specific question, uh, and this goes back to you, Christy. There looks like there's a Maybe you've got a little jumbled um, or your audio might have cut out. Uh, at the very end of your comments, you specifically noted a specific kind of regulation you were calling for um, uh, in Ohio specifically. Could you recap what that was? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we uh, desperately need um, some common sense regulations that would require um, farmers to only apply as much chemical fertilizer or manure as the crop actually needs. And so they call that the agronomic rate. And so in order to do that, you need to do a number of soil samples. And then also, we'd like to see tied with that um, certified plans to reduce the pollution, right? And so the farmer would work with a a professional, likely from the Soil Water Conservation District or Natural Resource Conservation Service, to draw up a plan for farm health and to keep that polluted um, runoff out of our rivers, lakes, and streams. Then they would ensure that it's implemented and also, in, you know, following up to make sure that um, they continue up with it to enforcement. 
So that's what we're looking for in the state of Ohio in terms of common sense regulation. But certainly we still need voluntary practices. We still need to invest in monitoring on um, stations and so we know how we're doing and we need funding for all of that. Thank you, Christy. That was very helpful. Uh, so we have a question that asks, what can individuals in cities like Chicago or elsewhere do in their homes and in their daily lives to reduce nutrient pollution? And Molly, I'll let you tackle that one first. Yeah, so this is a question we get a lot from people who want to do something to help solve these problems. And, and as this person points out, nutrient pollution and harmful algal blooms are actually an issue not just in the Western Lake Erie Basin, but all across the region. And they cause beach closures along with um, other issues like the drinking water crisis in Toledo. So this really is a problem that we're struggling with all across the Great Lakes region. Um, individuals can do things like make sure that you're not applying uh, any fertilizer to your lawn that has, fertil that has phosphorus in it. Most lawns, if they're already established, don't need phosphorus fertilizer. So that's something you can look at. Um, also, you can do simple things like um, not uh, doing your laundry or taking showers when there's a big rainstorm. Because during big rain events, it's harder for sewage treatment plants to keep up with the volume of water that's getting pumped in. And it's more likely that something like a sewage overflow will happen. So whatever you can do in your own home to reduce the amount of water you're adding to the system during a big rainstorm can also help. And I just, I'll stress that while I really always appreciate that people want to do whatever they can to take care of this problem, Ultimately, we're going to need the agricultural community to do a lot more to address this issue because they are the primary source of nutrients, uh, particularly in the Western Lake Erie Basin, but in some other places across the Great Lakes as well. And so we've been pleased to see so many farmers stepping up and voluntarily uh, taking actions to reduce nutrient in loading into the Great Lakes, but ultimately we're going to need a lot more and we're probably going to need more regulations like the ones that cities have to meet in terms of how much pollution they're allowed to discharge. Thank you, Molly. The next question, um, I'm going to pass over to perhaps Charlotte or Christy. The question is, why do farmers insist upon applying manure or fertilizer on frozen, frozen or saturated ground, even if it isn't getting absorbed into the soil? What's the incentive or what's the reason that farmers might do that? Christy well, or um, go ahead. Yeah, this is this is Christy. Um, so you know, livestock operators have a, many times a lot of manure, and sometimes they might not have the appropriate storage um, for to house that manure, and so they need to dispose of the manure. And if um, that's why you might see a farmer applying during frozen or snow-covered ground. Um, so that's, that's typically why that is. Great. Je Jen, it's Tony. If I could just weigh, weigh in on that quickly. I think, I think Ma, uh, Christy hit it um, earlier in one of her responses around agronomic rate, and it really comes down to um, how these nutrients, particular manure, are spread and why, right? So they, they ought not be spread um, as, a, as a disposal technique, um, as Christy's alluding to, but the, the they should be seen as, as fertilizer applied according to an agronomic rate to help, help crop growth. And we should be thinking about other things that could be done with that, that animal waste, for example, using it to, to, to generate energy, right? Uh, it's just a different use of that, of that resource and thinking about it as a resource as opposed to something that needs to be disposed of, um, which tends to, to drive some of these practices. And to piggyback on that, sorry, this is Chris again. Um, there is like there are some really great stories. There are some farmers that are doing some really amazing things, right? Like they have a lot of manure and they need to move it. They don't have enough land or maybe storage. And so what they will they will do um, is I've heard some farmers um, go to their surrounding neighbors and say, Hey, why don't you stop using chemical fertilizer? I'll sell you this manure at a, you know, the cost of moving it, and then you, you know, we have less chemical fertilizer being applied and we've solved this, a problem of storage for manure. 
A follow-up question to that from another uh, participant, uh, but related to this question of spreading manure and fertilizer. Um, the question is, even if all three jurisdictions enacted the spreading bans that you recommend, how would enforcement need to change to make these bans effective? The person notes that uh, Tony mentioned uh, enforcement is an issue with neighbors being a primary mechanism for reporting farms. So, uh, if those uh, bans are enacted, how would they be? How would we recommend that they be enforced? Christy or Tony, would you want to weigh in on that? Well, I can um, certainly get some thoughts, and I'm sure Tony has some too. Um, you know, in, in Ohio, and largely I would say this is probably the same in all the states, is we really rely on a, a complaint basis, right? So if my neighbor is spreading on frozen or snow-covered ground, then I may or may not call the state and report that. If I do report that, then, you know, somebody gets out there hopefully within a day or two, but that's not always the case. So I think that um, in order to enforce it, you would need to um, have random audits. You know, you would need to staff, uh, put some um, resources potentially in staff that may already be there, may not. Um, but you would have to do random audits and um, also take those complaints too and make sure that you can dispatch somebody very quickly um, and not in like three days or four days. Um, when it may not be a problem anymore to uh, get out there and document it. And then I think you also need to really um, educate farmers as well. And I know this is what Ohio is doing on chemical fertilizer, but not on manure, um, about why this is so important. You know, I think, I think Molly alluded to this. Farmers um, aren't bad people. They don't wake up in the morning, roll over, kiss their sauce, and say it's a wonderful day to go pollute the environment and throw a bunch of money down the tile drain. They farm this way because this is the way that they have to and they were taught because we're no longer talking about the small mom pop um, farms anymore that we think of fondly like Little House on the Prairie. We're talking large industrialized farms. And so I think that you would need to do some random, random audits. You would need to be very vigilant on um, the first couple of years. And then, you know, it could taper a little bit, but also answer those complaints in a really timely fashion. Thanks, Christy. Um, I have a question that's kind of a, a good one, a big one. Uh, so I'll have Molly tackle it first, and then maybe we could have each of the speakers representing the jurisdictions or representing a jurisdictional perspective, rather, uh, chime in. So the question is, who is actively organized to oppose progress on the three actions that are presented, and what strategies are being pursued to address them? Do you want to tackle that overall, Molly? Yeah, so I think, first of all, no one is actively opposed to a clean Lake Erie, right? You won't hear anyone saying, I want to pollute Lake Erie. I think the rub comes with um, whether there are enforceable regulations in place to prevent pollution of Lake Erie and other Great Lakes waterways. And so for the types of actions that we've outlined, um, what you'll often hear is, uh, opposition from the agricultural community to having regulations in place that ban manure and fertilizer spreading on frozen or saturated ground, or to having required comprehensive nutrient reduction plans. Um, so that's where you really, that's where we often see opposition, but I think it would be interesting to hear uh, a little bit more from each of the jurisdictions. So maybe Charlotte, you could start, and then Tony and then Christy talk about opposition in your jurisdictions. Yeah, so I mean, I would echo what, what Molly just said in that, you know, I think there is a disagreement um, within, uh, you know, the environmental and agricultural community about exactly how to go about implementing these sorts of policies and, you know, real reliance and interest in continuing to rely on voluntary programs. Um, and environmental and conservation organizations here in Michigan have seen um, that those are just not working. And so we've been pushing for something much stronger. Um, and I think that's where you kind of see some, some opposition in terms of um, what we are calling for specifically. I would also say, and it's less on the opposition side, but 
you know, you look at the, the Department of uh, Environmental Quality here in Michigan, the Department of Natural Resources, you know, they have an awesome responsibility and a lot of work to do and don't necessarily have all of the resources and all of the staff that they need to do it. And frankly, also don't have all of the statutory authority um, to go off and do the things that, that we are asking them to do. And so they really do have to work hand in glove with the legislature here in Michigan around um, funding appropriations, around things like a statewide ban on, on manure. Um, and so I think there is uh, continuing conversations between all of those moving pieces around how we can get some of this, um, some better solutions in place for Lake Erie, but it takes time and it takes negotiation and it takes resources and those are all difficult um, difficult things to, to kind of um, come together around and find compromise on. So I wouldn't say opposition, uh, but that definitely is sort of a piece of the puzzle um, here. And then the final thing I would say too is that you look at something like what's happening in the Chesapeake Bay that's been really, really successful. The EPA has sort of put the, the bay on, on a total maximum daily load, a pollution diet essentially, and all of the jurisdictions, all of the states and the District of Columbia have come together um, to put in place really solid plans that are um, have been shown to be driving down the amount of nutrients flowing into the Chesapeake Bay and really working. And I think there is some um, concern here in Michigan about um, federal government kind of coming in and and doing similar programs here and that's a double-edged sword right um, sure we would like to see that happen um, but at the same time if it means that 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 it's going to spur state action um, because we want to keep that authority here and we want to be able to drive the direction of things then maybe it can also be a boon to really getting some of this stuff done here so I think there's a lot of sort of issues at play All right, Tony here. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pick up quickly on, on some of those threads uh, as it relates to Ontario. And I think, um, you know, we've, we've hit the high points. I think the, the, big, the big thing to recognize in terms of uh, organized opposition is, is really that the conversation is, is not about if and whether um, we deal uh, with the problems facing Lake Erie and, and, in, and specifically um, reducing nutrient pollution uh, that's causing the algal blooms. It's more about about the details of how I would say, and I also want to kind of be clear that uh, I don't I don't think it's useful to think about um, environmental organizations and and uh, agricultural producers necessarily. And I'm not suggesting that, that my colleagues have by any stretch, but I, as as kind of warring parties, I think in fact what we're we're working towards is trying to find uh, uh, whether it's a middle ground or a, or, a, or a solution that we agree on, and that's why we're kind of looking for, as Christy called them, common sense uh, regulations to backstop, to work alongside the voluntary mechanisms that are in place and are being adopted so that, um, so that we're having and driving action by all farmers, not just the ones that uh, may be uh, more inclined to take those, those voluntary actions. Um, as we know, you know, in, in, in many parts of North America, uh, Canada is not different in the sense that um, uh, there is a strong political voice uh, on the part of, of the agricultural community, and they do have influence over decision makers. So, um, you know, the solution in my mind is to continue to work together um, and from our view to reinforce and find these common sense regulatory solutions that, that, um, that drive uh, common sense use of nutrients. Um, you know, nobody necessarily wants these things flowing into the waterways or flowing into the lake. Um, so driving those common sense solutions that, that may also um, find a sweet spot around increasing increasing agricultural yields and, and protecting soil health. So a more comprehensive approach, um, but one that clearly is aimed at uh, aimed at reducing that pollution and, and driving us to a healthy lake. So a lot's been said, and I really won't, and I would agree with everything that was said, right? Um, in Ohio, um, I will just note a few things. I think what has been said is we're all after the same goal, a healthy Lake Erie. Um, so the Farm Bureau has invested some money, about a billion dollars, in some research, um, and they're looking at, like, um, less management practices and farm field runoff. 
And then they're also working to try to pass a water um, trust and to fund, to provide funding for um, nutrient reduction. And they also, right after 2014, the water, the Toledo water crisis, sent a letter to their members saying, look, you need to get on board. Please start doing some, please develop and implement a nutrient management plan. Now, I think as we've heard, um, the farmers that are going, to, there are farmers doing great things, and they're going to continue to keep coming to um, the table and, you know, participate in those voluntary programs. What we're trying to capture is what we need, and that is a much broader scale of these practices being implemented. Um, and so I would, you know, I would just echo everything that my, my colleagues said. Thanks, Christy. Uh, my next question I'm going to toss to Molly first, and then others may want to weigh in. Uh, the question is, how is the 40% uh, goal, 40% reduction in phosphorus pollution goal, how is that arrived at? Um, can you talk a little bit about the history of that? Absolutely. So there's been a ton of research on Western Lake Erie and the sources of nutrients that are flowing into the lake that are causing these harmful algal blooms. And the scientific consensus from the International Joint Commission, the University of Michigan, um, a number of, of sources uh, across uh, the region and really across the country uh, have arrived at the 40% goal and, and the 40% reduction in phosphorus will not completely eliminate harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie. So it will substantially reduce the number of algal blooms that occur, um, but it, it, it won't totally get rid of them. And the reason for that is that um, to totally eliminate harmful algal blooms on Lake Erie would, would almost be impossible. It would be, it would be a really big lift, and the 40% is, is already a pretty big lift. So if we can get to 40%, we can reduce harmful algal blooms most of the time and make sure that on the off year when we do have a bloom that it's much, much smaller and much less impactful than the types of blooms that we're likely to see this year or that we saw a couple of years ago when the city of Toledo and other communities lost their drinking water. Um, the other thing that I would stress about this 40% goal is that the three actions that we've identified that are necessary to move forward toward that goal aren't enough to achieve it. So these are really the first steps that we feel like each of the jurisdictions needs to commit to and accomplish, but they're going to have to do even more to get all the way to the 40% reduction. And so, you know, we're trying to get them off on the right foot, um, and hopefully over the next year they're going to tick off uh, completing these actions so that we can outline the next several that they need to do in order to make the next steps toward the reduction goal. Thanks, Molly. We yeah, have if another I can just add it. it oh, sorry, yeah, I was going to add, Jen, it's, it's, it's Tony. Um, uh, I just want, thought I'd reinforce that, that that is why one of uh, our number three recommendation, though, is so critical uh, because what Molly was saying is, is you know, um, a lot of work has gone into uh, to modeling and figuring out what that 40% target should be or, or landing on that 40% target, but we really won't know um, if that's the right target until we, until we uh, get moving and collect the evidence to demonstrate that we're making progress towards it. So it may need to be adapted, and that may be adapted up or down over time, right? Um, but, but you can only do that if you have effective monitoring programs in place to track the amount of nutrients that are, that are coming through uh, the creeks and rivers into the lake so that we know if we're, we're making progress toward that 40% reduction target and or if we, uh, if we have an opportunity or a need to shift it. That's a very good point. Thank you, Tony. Uh, the next question we have is um, a little bigger picture but uh, and also more towards the public. What are some of the best places on the Internet where the public can go to learn about water quality in the Great Lakes? Um, and uh, what data is most important for us to look for. Um, some of our panelists may have uh, some thoughts on that. One thing I do want to highlight that is a particular interest for this topic around the harmful algal blooms during the summer season is NOAA, N-O-A-A, which is a U.S. agency, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, that's a mouthful. Uh, their Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab puts out a weekly forecast uh, which gives very helpful information about um, the size and uh, sort of tentative 
forecasted locations for the bloom in western Lake Erie. So we certainly would uh, encourage people to check out that resource if you are uh, concerned about specifically about the al algal bloom. Uh, do any of our panelists want to chime in on any other resources that may be uh, helpful for the public as they try and understand uh, the health of Lake Erie and all of the Great Lakes as well as this issue? So this is Christy. I will say the Ohio Sea Grant has some really great articles on um, the, the particular algae that is plaguing Lake Erie, how it's impacting our health, and they're doing a lot of research around that. Um, they have a twine mine, um, so you could go to their website. Certainly all of our websites on the web have stuff on it. Um, we just posted a video about um, how, you know, toxic algae is formed, and um, we're posting additional videos throughout the summer. I will say that in o if you're in Ohio, too, we have um, a website for um, looking to see if there's a harmful algal bloom in your you know, around in your beach, like at your beach or in your drinking water. Um, and I generally, I'm sorry, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I generally just type in harmful algal bloom, Ohio harmful algal bloom, um, you know, data or advisories and um, find it that way. But certainly you can check, uh, and as well as like if you're going to the beach, the Ohio Department of Health website for beach advisories. So those are some of um, some good resources, but I would say, you know, Ohio Sea Grant would be for like everybody because they have some really great information in there um, about what they're doing and looking at like the toxin and is it impacting our food and some other things as well. Thanks, Christy. Tony, I don't know if you have any specific Canadian resources that you would want to offer as well. Yeah, um, let me let me point to a couple that I that I like. Um, so in terms of of uh, lo very kind of local uh, watershed data about water quality, um, in Ontario we have uh, our conservation authorities as local watershed based agencies, and and they do a ton of work on water quality and quantity. Uh, they uh, many of them do watershed report cards. Now those aren't real time, but they do. Uh, compile information and give you a sense of, of uh, the overall situation on a watershed by watershed basis, including uh, those that uh, that flow into into Lake Erie. So um, you can look at Conservation Ontario is the overarching uh, umbrella organization, and and from there you'll find a map where you can where you can uh, get into the uh, the specific watershed um, conservation authorities, and I think it's 36 of them that we have in Ontario. Uh, in terms of the backstory uh, uh, on Lake Erie and the algae issue, I, I like to uh, to point folks to LakeErieAlgae.com. It kind of is a slick website that that kind of tells the story in, in a simple way um, about what's uh, what's happening in Lake Erie with timelines and things like that. And then, and then um, a more real time kind of view in terms of using um, uh, or accessing water is uh, colleagues at the Lake Ontario Waterkeeper or Swim Drink Fish Canada. And their swim guide, and that's just at theswimguide.org, and it's an app you can put on your phone uh, and quickly find out if uh, the conditions of, of of beaches and whether they are uh, they are swimmable uh, at any given time. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I have a question uh, that I think I'll kick to Molly, which is asking about um, the potential impact of. Uh, proposed cuts here in the U.S. to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency um, and some of the budget proposals that have been floated at the federal level that may significantly reduce uh, funding and staffing for a variety of environmental programs around the region uh, and how that might impact the ability to uh, monitor and manage uh, and enforce some of these concerns that we've raised today. Molly? Such an important question. And if you're on our email list, you probably got an email from me about this, about the need to make sure that the Environmental Protection Agency and other federal agencies have the funding that they need to protect our air and water. And certainly, 
the Environmental Protection Agency is charged with making sure that our water is uh, safe to drink. Uh, their actual charge is to make sure that under the Clean Water Act, we have fishable, drinkable, and swimmable waters. And we know for sure that Lake Erie is already struggling uh, in all of those uh, categories each year. And to give less money to the agencies that are working to improve that situation doesn't make any sense. So I think all of our organizations on this call are strong advocates for full funding for the Environmental Protection Agency so that it can do its job protecting the lakes and supporting the states as they're trying to take action to resolve these issues. Thanks, Molly. If, Jen, may I just quickly jump in? This is Christy. I agree completely we need to continue to fund the EPA. But let's not forget about um, the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service. Their technical assistance grants are being cut. Um, it's not eliminated. And those are the people that are on the ground that are helping farmers um, put plans together for farm health, soil health. And then, um, you know, there's wastewater, um, you know, grants in the USDA. NOAA is on the chopping block. Ohio Sea Grant is, as well as other sea grants. So the ripple effect is um, will be felt far and wide, and I, you know, like I really will take us spiraling backwards. Thanks, Christy. Uh, my next question is for Charlotte, um, and uh, the, the there, and we have a few questions asking about other areas of the Great Lakes um, and uh, if there are problems with nutrient pollution and algal blooms in other parts of the Great Lakes. And I know that this is an issue in Michigan beyond just the Western Lake Erie Basin. Uh, so I thought uh, if you could tell us a little bit about that and how other parts of uh, particularly Michigan are impacted by this issue. Yeah, so I mean, harmful algal blooms, toxic algal blooms are things that we see crop up in Michigan in our lakes and rivers um, every summer now. Um, you look at some place like Saginaw Bay, which has had a chronic uh, algal bloom problem there. Um, a lot of similar issues to what we're seeing in Lake Erie um, happening there as well. Um, Lake Makatawa on the west side of the state um, has also had chronic algal bloom issues. Silver Lake, there's a number, there's a number of lakes and rivers all across the state that are seeing this. And you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that the drivers are the same in each and every single water body. Um, I do believe that in many places, um, agriculture tends to play a big role like it does um, in, in Lake Erie. Um, but if you look at something like uh, Lake St. Clair, um, a lot of the sort of uh, water uh, pollution um, and contamination problems that we're seeing there um, is from infrastructure and it's from sewer water overflows um, and raw sewage being essentially dumped into the into the lake. So, um, so there's different drivers. Michigan also is the only state in the entire nation uh, that does not have a statewide septic code that sets minimum uh, standards for safety standards for how septics um, should be installed and maintained and inspected to make sure that they're not failing. Um, and so that's a huge problem in a lot of a lot of our smaller inland lakes and rivers um, is failing septic systems. So the drivers are, are a little bit different in some of these places, um, but we've got sound policy solutions. We know this is, these are issues that are happening across the state. Um, and so I think the more we can continue to see um, the real solutions put into place in Lake Erie, that gives me more hope for some of these other places across Michigan too. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, we have uh, time for one more question, um, and that is uh, asking about the role of Pennsylvania and New York, which are two states that do border eastern Lake Erie, um, and what their involvement in uh, the pollution reduction goals and what they're doing to help, uh, and uh, if they are helping or not. Molly, do you want to start tackling that one? Absolutely. So this call is largely about harmful algal blooms in western Lake Erie, but there are also issues with a dead zone, an area where there's no oxygen in the water, so no fish can live there uh, every summer. That happens in the central basin of Lake Erie. And then further east, there are other types of nuisance algae that are causing issues with beach closures and some other, other problems in the eastern basin. And so, you know, Lake Erie is challenged in a number of ways, and all of the states 
states have a role to play in addressing those problems. New York and Pennsylvania are not responsible uh, for the blooms occurring in the Western Lake Erie Basin. They have been helpful in terms of putting some pressure on the other states um, and province to do more to tackle harmful algal blooms in Western Lake Erie. And they're both actually also um, submitting plans for how they plan to reduce pollution into Lake Erie that will help address that dead zone in the central basin and those nuisance algal blooms that I talked about in the eastern basin. Um, so definitely a role to play um, and uh, helping to keep this issue at the top of the radar screen for citizens all around um, Lake Erie is important. Thanks, Molly. So we are reaching the top of the hour. Um, we have had a huge number of questions, and I'm sorry that we just aren't going to be able to get to all of them. We've tried to get to as many as we could and uh, hit a different, uh, a number of different areas. Uh, there's certainly a lot to tackle in this issue. Uh, if you do have a specific question, I would encourage you to reach out to us here at the Alliance or any of our, the other groups on the call, Freshwater Future, Michigan League of Conservation Voters, and the Ohio Environmental Council um, all have uh, tremendous expertise on staff who can help you uh, learn more about the issue and get involved. Um, so one final quick pitch. Uh, we are launching, all of our groups today are launching a petition to the governors of Ohio and Michigan, as well as the premier of Ontario, encouraging them to take swift action on the three uh, priority action items we have outlined today. And we will be delivering that to the governors um, in early October prior to their meeting um, in the fall. Uh, also, stay tuned, as Tony mentioned, uh, our groups are getting together on a more detailed analysis and uh, that we will be releasing in early October as well. So certainly a lot more to come on this issue. I do want to say a big thank you to all of our presenters today. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be a part of this and answering all these great questions. And thank you to all of you who participated and tuned in today. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.